So welcome back, everybody. It's um, 5 p.m. my place here in Sweden. Uh, it's 9 a.m. back in Edmonton local time. It's a great pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker, Dr. Melik Erol Kantarsi. She is um, Canada Research Chair in AI Enabled Next Generation Wireless Networks, also Associate Professor at the School of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at the University of Ottawa. Canada. The title of Mel's talk this morning is AI Enabled Wireless Networks, a vision for 6G. So please join me in welcoming Mel on the virtual Zoom stage. Thank you very much, Carl, for this warm introduction. Uh, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. That's the usual way we start our sessions because uh, we have guests, audience from all around the world. It's a great pleasure to address the LCN 2021 attendees today. My name is Malarol Kantarje. I'm a Canada Research Chair in AI-enabled Next Generation Wireless Networks and an Associate Professor at the University of Ottawa in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. Uh, so my time zone is 11 a.m. this morning. Um, so, as well as being uh, Canada Research Chair and Associate Professor, I'm the Director of NetCore Labs, and I'm also an IEEE ComSoft Distinguished Lecturer. Today, I'll be talking about AI-enabled wireless networks, which is my favorite topic to talk about, uh, because um, there's a lot of excitement from the industry about how machine learning AI techniques can impact the future of wireless communications. Uh, we started this uh, in 5G and even in 4G, we had some uh, hints of you know, intelligence, of course, uh, but now our desire is to drive it for 6G. So uh, the pandemic showed us that staying connected is one of the most important things, the needs. It was like electricity or water. Without staying connected, it would have been impossible to work from home for remote offices. Uh, the pandemic showed us uh, the importance of connectivity, regardless of what generation we are talking about. Even this keynote wouldn't have been possible without uh, the existence of wireless communications, although I'm using Wi-Fi from my home. And another thing we observed and we desired and you know, sometimes we were able to do was to escape from the hustle of the big cities and go to our cottages or rent a cottage and go somewhere remote rural so that we can uh, still keep connected with the work. But for some, it did not work very well because of the gap in connectivity of big cities and rural areas. So that emerged as one of the needs. So if you look at the, um, the, the changes in work culture, like how we got used to working over Zoom and maybe in the future, we are going to uh, get used to working using our holograms. You'd be able to see my hologram in a ballroom of a hotel and yours as well. Then after the keynote, we would be you know, going out to a coffee booth and would we'd be able to grab coffee together. And for the rural connectivity, maybe I would be doing this in my cottage, um, you know, in a remote area. But for today, it's not that easy because of the reasons that I mentioned. So this is one of the things that we need improvement in the next generations of wireless. And it's not only about us going to cottage and keeping connected, of course, it's about driving innovation and economy in those places. Uh, another very important uh, aspect of, uh, again, regardless of generation connectivity, was the advances we made in smart production, smart factories, especially Industry 4.0. Now you're seeing over here some robotic hands manipulating uh, a factory line and another uh, robot controlling everything uh, using the digital twin of the process. 
So we are almost there. These technologies have been considered or uh, discussed since the time, since the end of uh, 4G LTE and the beginning of 5G. Uh, but the promise of getting the one millisecond latency, and I mean, the desires go for, of course, real time, which is very, very hard. Uh, even sub millisecond latencies are going to be uh, probably the main drivers of 6G, but we're going to see if we're gonna uh, be able to attain this or not. So these, were, these things have been challenging in, in 5G and will keep the, driving our uh, innovations in 6G. So if you look at the 5G use cases, so we're gonna take a step back from 6G and talk about 5G first. And this is uh, a picture that I like. It, it, it's quite old actually, more than a decade ago, it's from International Telecommunications Union, but it uh, really nicely shows the, um, the state of the art at that time, how we envisioned uh, 5G would be, what use cases would be. At that time, uh, enhanced mobile broadband, uh, still uh, accommodated users, human users like us. Uh, it was for our desires of downloading 360 videos, being able to do AR, XR uh, games and augmented reality, being able to maybe play out there Pokemon Go with our friends um, without using pepper devices. Uh, but then um, there were two other things, two other use cases. Uh, which one is, uh, again, you know, a dear to my heart, ultra reliable and low latency communications, which soon after we realized that it's not really easy to do these two things at the same time. But the idea was that this was going to serve industrial automation, mission critical applications and self-driving cars. We still have a lot of way to go there. Uh, and the third one is massive machine type communications. Of course, with smart grids, smart cities, there are tons of devices that are requiring connectivity. It doesn't mean that all of them are going to use 5G, by the way. 5G is just one of the um, players of the connectivity market who wants to get a share. But if we can improve the performance to a level that is satisfactory to the users, then it, it would have a good share out of this big uh, growing market. And what's funny about this picture is that uh, voice communications, our good old voice communications, where the first, the second, the third generation was mostly, you know, considering about human centric, uh, how do we take off people from the landline, how to make them mobile, and then maybe to be able to send text messages, multimedia messages. This is like um, becoming a small part of uh, wireless networks. And we already saw in 5G that it's all about verticals. Now, the question of what 6G will be is a big question. Um, I think we also have another keynote on the third day of LCN where Mati will be talking about maybe more broader perspectives of these technologies. But in this talk, I will focus only the AI uh, perspective. There are many um, alternative or candidate technologies like intelligent reflecting surfaces at the physical layer, terahertz communications, uh, integrating sense, integrated sensing and localization, non-terrestrial networks. All of these things I'm sure you have heard of in you know, this or that uh, talk could be a part of 6G. But what's important here is, I think from today is the focus on how can we advance what we did with 5G? Because if we do not start research, if we don't do research about 6G today, it's going to be too late. You know, the generations of wireless networks repeats in 10, 10 year cycles and the research into it starts actually much earlier. So I'm going to give this my opinion. I'm going to explain a couple of the things that are important to me and that we focus in our lab, but this is not, you know, an exhaustive list, of course. I think after 5G, we're going to see more diverse set of users and verticals. I think this is sort of obvious, but answering, you know, what's going to be the killer application of 6G is quite different. I'm not that of a futurist that can, you know, have a crystal ball and tell you what's going to be in the future. Um, what comes as uh, an, an important and promising uh, area is making use of semantics, because all this time our, our systems were optimized based on theoretical capacity limitations of Shannon. Now we might be at an era, and this is a might, I'm not saying we are, uh, we need to do more research in that area. 
that we can use context of information coming from sensing, localization, and all that. And maybe without transferring uh, those many bits, we could attain some valuable information, useful information. Having that on one side, uh, another uh, technology that I see and many of the industry uh, participants, players see as an important uh, part of the 6G or anticipated to be an important part of 6G is being AI native. I call it AI enabled, uh, but you could call it AI native, but in a sense, it's increasing the network automation, the level of automation. The ultimate goal is to have no human intervention, having very strong robust control algorithms, but we still have some way to go there. Now, <laughs> the question about network automation, as, as a Canada research chair in AI-enabled networks, I often get asked, uh, is this the first time we are using machine intelligence, machine learning, or some sort of intelligence in networks? And actually, the answer is no. Uh, we had self-organizing networks since LTE. It's not, it's not a new concept. But when we say AI native or AI enabled, we are talking about something much bigger than that. What we can achieve by SON is usually at the uh, configuration time, self-configuration. We're not able to go into too much details of self-optimization. And the complexity of the network is increasing, so the existing SON approaches are not really sufficient for the next generation. They're not sufficient for 5G. They're not going to be sufficient for 6G. Now, why I'm saying this, why I'm saying it's not going to be sufficient. Uh, with 5G, we have seen that. Um, especially millimeter wave technologies, uh, the propagation ranges of the signals are dropping. So we need more base stations and we're gonna have small cells, but maybe even worse, we're gonna have directional cells. So it's going to be beams flying, well, it is uh, with the millimeter wave uh, base stations, um, beams flying all around, trying to steer users, track users, lock into them, and then uh, trying to provide coverage and capacity for the users. These are complex problems and it is getting more complex with time. Um, number two uh, challenge that is uh, 5G and 6G are facing is the massive, the, the increase in the number of devices. We are faced with, we're not only using the smartphones, we're not only talking about the connectivity of the smartphones of the users, we're talking about machines. We're talking about millions of devices being connected and sharing only a very limited pool of uh, resources. So again, this increases the complexity. Uh, we're talking about multiple antenna arrays, and this multiple is, is really huge. It's going to the level of uh, several hundreds. Today, of course, we, we know about MIMO. It's not a new technology, but bringing, bringing it to the massive level or ultra-massive levels um, are still bringing a lot of complexities. Then on the side of this you know, physical layer realities, uh, we also have, we said we're going to have massive number of devices, but these devices are going to probably need some processing uh, capabilities, which doesn't exist on board for them because they are cheap, small devices. So mobile edge computing or multi-access edge computing uh, will be an integral part of uh, 5G and 6G. We already have uh, fogs and some computational capacity around base stations, which we are using. But imagine with the massive number of devices, massive number of equipment, uh, it's gonna be a challenge to find the optimal places to, be, to do these offloading uh, tasks. Another interesting uh, uh, revolution, I would say, happening on the radio access side is about ORAN. So the journey started with virtualization, the segregation of RAN, it continued with Cloud RAN. And now we're seeing a lot of efforts towards uh, opening the interfaces. So basically defining open standards for the uh, interfaces between um, RAN hardware and software so that we can have a multiple vendor environment, which again increases the complexities. And network slicing, although core and transport slicing are very mature, slicing at the run and slicing at the edge are still uh, increasingly complex uh, problems. Again, because of the increasing number of devices, increasing number of computing resources at distributed locations. So to address this you know, increasing um, complexity, 
we need an increasing level of intelligence. And the ultimate goal is um, closed loop automation, which means no human intervention. So in 2019, uh, we published an article in IEEE Nuclear Technology Magazine, and we discussed some of these ideas. At that time, we were mostly focusing on 5G. We were talking about AI-enabled 5G. And today's talk, I will show a lot of the things that we do um, with respect to 5G release uh, 1516. Uh, but uh, I will also try to give you a little bit hints about what we need to do for uh, 6G. Now, uh, before we get into, uh, you know, how one can use AI machine learning techniques for 5G or 6G, even that, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about that AI part. We're saying AI enabled wireless networks. What do we mean by this? First of all, AI is a very big uh, research area. Uh, when we say we are using AI, or even with this presentation in an hour long uh, keynote, if I promise you that I'm going to cover everything about AI, that would be a lie, it's impossible. Instead, I'm gonna focus on a very specific uh, area in AI. Uh, so AI is the big umbrella term that uh, defines, uh, or uh, yeah, it is used to define the human inference capabilities in machines. So we want to have machines that can think and act like humans. But underneath AI, there has been several algorithms developed and those big bunch of algorithms are considered in machine learning literature. When we look at machine learning literature, we can collect the uh, algorithms methods under four distinct areas. Supervised learning, unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning, and deep learning. For supervised learning, we need labels. For unsupervised learning, we try to learn from data that doesn't have any labels, but we need to, they have some similarities, so they can be put in some clusters. Reinforcement learning, that's an interesting one. That's what I'm going to be talking about. And then deep learning part is architectures that are helping for compact representations in neural networks. So why am I focusing on reinforcement learning? Reinforcement learning uh, mimics something very interesting in human and animal learning. It's the interactive learning process. So for a long time, people in AI thought that if we were to give the rules uh, of our thinking, of human thinking, of a system to a machine, the machine would be intelligent enough. But then soon after, it was noticed that this is not enough because humans don't are not born with a handbook of the world around us, right? I mean, we make mistakes. We learn from our mistakes. You climb a tree, you fall, or your mom shouts at you, yells at you, and you don't do it again. Or you successfully climb, and that's a good thing for you. Um, but this interactive learning process, uh, can it be replicated in the machines? That's the question. And that has been a question uh, in people's mind for a very long time. So it's not a new concept. Actually, it goes back to Pavlov's psychological trials with uh, cats and dogs where, where uh, he used treats to enforce, reinforce a certain um, behavior in animals. But I'm not gonna go back that far. I'm gonna take you back to 1950s and we're gonna start with Richard Bellman um, where he used uh, reinforcement learning for op uh, for modeling optimal control theory problems. And that's where the control perspective actually comes. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about Bauman equations uh, soon, but let's see uh, who else contributed to the field. And this is a very limited list. I cannot name everyone, of course, but just uh, some milestones, let me say, uh, in the history of reinforcement learning. And we see an interesting figure. Claude Shannon, what is he doing here, right? <laughs> He's actually, uh, of course, a very well-known person for information theory people, but quite interestingly, in 1952, around those years, uh, he also made experiments by using relays to lead a mouse out of its cage. So these are considered as reinforced the initial steps uh, or trials about reinforcement learning. So it shows us that there was actually a lot of interest in the field at those times. In 1960s, um, Martin Minsky studied the credit assignments problem. As we will see in my next slides, 
credits and reports play a fundamental role in reinforcement learning. And you can, I think, automatically understand that if you have a pet at home, how treats teach, teach them good uh, behavior, but then how do you give treats? When do you give them? How much do you give? Uh, those are <laughs> some questions you might be uh, tackling. In 1970s, we have Harry Clough, uh, who actually influenced later years uh, reinforcement learning researchers. Because at the time, um, a lot of the people were thinking, as I said before, if we give the rules to a machine, that machine will become intelligent. But he argued that adaptive behavior of human learning would be missed if we did that. And this uh, influenced the 1980s to famous people in reinforcement learning literature. They are the authors of the reinforcement learning book, Andrew Barton and Richard Sutton. Uh, they made a lot of contributions to this field. But we had to wait until 1989 for Chris Watkins to come up with temporal difference equations, which I'm going to show are quite useful tools for model-free environments. And in 1990s, it was a hype, it was crazy. Everybody was uh, interested in uh, game-playing machines, backgammon, chess, Go. And on, in this picture, we only see Gerald Tessera from IBM with his backgammon machine. But yeah, it was a great ambition for men, women to uh, design a machine that could beat a human opponent. Uh, and one interesting thing, I mean, although we, we, we explain these topics like being AI enabled, AI native as quite recent new topics, in the beginning of 2000s, there were studies about applying reinforcement learning to networks. But at the time, because of the long convergence times and because of um, lack of computational resources, people uh, decided that these techniques might not be ideal. We still see some of the back rows like uh, that was observed around those times, but uh, we try to overcome these by more advanced uh, AI machine learning algorithms. Now let's talk a little bit about reinforcement learning, uh, and then I'm going to show how we use these in, in our research. So as I said, reward is very important. So that little dog over there is excited about the reward. Uh, in reinforcement learning, we have an agent who is interacting with the environment. The agent takes an action and it moves to its next state. While doing that, while moving to the next state, the agent receives a reward. This reward is very important because that is going to reinforce our agent towards a certain behavior. And if you consider like this is a repeated action sequence, so it's not like one time, uh, like the Pavlov uh, case, it was trial and error mostly, but the difference in reinforcement learning is like it's not a one-time thing. There is a long sequence of actions which we call as policies. Now, and you can imagine, we can make a really nice analogy with a game of chess. So you start with one action, you make some decisions, and in the end, the game might go into a certain different direction uh, if you had done another move at one point in time. So you have lots of policies, lots of strategies to choose from them, and then there is only one that's optimal. So in the picture on the right-hand side, you are seeing a bolded line that is showing the uh, optimal policy. Now, how are we going to define what's optimal, right? Let me first start with a very brief uh, introduction of Markov decision process, where we will use the terms in, uh, in the definition of reward and policy. So ST shows the state of an agent at time t. AT is the action uh, that the agent takes at time t. And the reward works like this. So given we are at the state ST, the agent takes action AT. It moves to the next state, the clock ticks. ST plus one, and during that, the agent receives the reward RT plus one. If we're talking about a deterministic system, if we know which next state our agent is going to choose, we wouldn't need the next state probability. But for stochastic environments, which most of the time we are working with, we need the next state probability. So uh, there is a probability of switching to the next state ST plus one, given that we are at state ST and the agent takes action AT. 
Uh, the reward can also be probabilistic. It doesn't have to be. But again, in real times, uh, in real world systems, we usually need that flexibility. And if you think about the uh, ga gambling machines, um, it's very you know, obvious that you, you, move, you make the same move, but you don't get the same reward. So uh, there's, pro there's a stochastic behavior in the reward. Uh, then we have the episode, uh, the trial of actions from the initial state to goal state. So on a chess game, that would be you start with some move and then you end with some move. And the policy, the actions in between, the sequence of actions are called the policies. Now, a policy is a mapping from states to actions and every policy has a value. How come the policy has a value? It has to, it has to be something numeric and that comes with the rewards. So for a finite horizon game, if I was defining a finite horizon um, policy, what would happen is I could have added up all the rewards that I collected from the beginning. Like you start paying, ping, 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 you collect the rewards and you're done there. And if it's a finite horizon game, that's not a big problem. But if it's an infinite horizon game, now your, uh, let's say, um, 100 moves later reward, the reward that you're gonna get after 100 iterations, is it so important to you at your first move? Probably not. You don't want to be so far looking. I mean, you don't. You want to look a few steps ahead, but you don't want to you know, consider all your 100 steps or 1,000 steps later. That's what actually uh, the formula of expected reward just in the middle of the slides is telling us. So we are accumulating the future rewards, but we are accumulating with gamma. Gamma is the discount factor, which is between zero and one. So it keeps reducing the impact of uh, future rewards on the current value of the policy. Now, I told you like Bellman uh, worked on this problem. He was the founders uh, of this problem. He came up with this optimal policy equation uh, which is the action that is max, which gives us the action that maximizes the summation of expected future reward plus the expected uh, value of the maximum policy in the future iterations. And it has a next state probability. So if the environment is not deterministic, then we can use this P probability. Uh, now, if we know the environments, if we know these probabilities, even if it's a stochastic environment, if we know the probabilities, the value of the probabilities, then we can calculate this uh, equation uh, recursively. So we can use dynamic programming to solve this. But what happens is for a model free environment like wireless, we're not able to use this formulation. So what we do is we resort to model-free learning. In model-free learning, we use temporal difference equation. So it's like, you know, um, here there's a children's uh, game that you play, like you go into certain direction and your friends uh, yell at you, like it's cold, cold, cold. So you're going far, hot, hot, hot. So you come closer. Uh, it's like that. We search the space of the Q table and try to approach to the optimal value. Now, the, the word that I said about searching the space of Q table should raise some flags. We're gonna to come to that. But before that, uh, as we are searching through the space of something, there's always a possibility that we end up with a local maximum or local minimum. So in order to uh, combat this problem, uh, people in machine learning literature have come up with an idea of using exploration and exploitation. Uh, we usually use epsilon greedy approach for uh, exploration and exploitation, but first let me explain what, it, what this is about. And actually, there's a very nice story about that. <laughs> I like telling in my talks. Um, so at one time, um, Google uh, research, when uh, a machine designed by Google researchers was playing AlphaGo against a human opponent, the machine took some decision and the human, the engineers uh, who designed the machine said that, oh my goodness, you know, that was a wrong move, so we're gonna lose the game. Uh, but eventually the machine was making uh, exploration. It was taking a risky action to see if the rewards in that direction would give itself be uh, better benefits. And eventually uh, it won the game. Uh, so uh, this, is, uh, this is a good example of how we use exploration. So in order not to get stuck in a certain point, uh, our agents can sometimes take random actions with some small probability. Of course, we don't want to do it too much because then it would impact our convergence. And then as we keep learning that probability should be reduced so that we can dampen the convergence curve, 
Uh, but anyhow, we give a, a chance to the agent to go out of the box to, to try something that we haven't thought. Uh, so that doesn't always you know, list the best actions to see if there is something better around itself. Now, going back to searching the uh, Q space. So I said like in temporal difference equations, you know, we search the Q table. Now that Q table thing is tricky. Um, if we define a problem, in wireless or in anywhere with a small number of states and actions, it's actually a nice method. The Q-learning technique works quite well. Uh, but the problem comes when the state and action space uh, gets larger. So if you have uh, two, three states and you have two, three actions at the same time, that grows exponentially. And that can be very costly to search through that Q-table. Your convergence will be um, very, very large and um, your time complexity would be very large. Another thing is um, we don't always work, work with problems where the state space is discrete. In our problems, sometimes state space is continuous and Q-learning cannot solve this. So we have policy gradient approaches to solve this problem. And for the uh, space explosion problem, we can use something else. And that something else is function approximation. As you might imagine, now we have a big table. It could be like, a, you could consider it like a two-dimensional, um, or n-dimensional data, uh, how would you, you know, handle a data? Well, what do you do if you have you know, huge amount of data to basically simplify it? You parametrize it, right? You have some estimation and the simplest estimation, you draw a regression line, uh, but most likely it won't give you a good result, but it will be an estimation. You'll have just two parameters. What you can do is you can make it a curve, add more parameters, or ultimately you can go for a neural network and create a little bit of a simple filter uh, to say that, you know, I have this big bunch of data and then I can represent it with a lower number of uh, dimensions. That's what we are trying to do with deep reinforcement learning. So in reinforcement learning, uh, we have an agent interacting with the environment, but if it's a model-free environment, we're using Q-learning. With Q-learning, we have the problem of explosion in the table size. So to overcome this problem, we can put a neural network to drive, to estimate the values of the Q-table, and we can drive our reinforcement learning uh, techniques. Now, uh, Let's go back and take a look, a little bit of a historical look again uh, to, uh, to neural networks, a very quick one. So um, this goes back to 50s, 60s again, uh, the idea of perceptrons, uh, which are the you know, ancestors of neurons and the design by Frank Rosenblatt, where we have a decision circuit. We have some inputs, x1, x2, x3. They go inside the decision circuit, a very simple one in this in the slide that you see a threshold. If the weighted sum of the inputs are less than a threshold, the output is zero, otherwise it is one. Uh, now, a single perceptron is of course <laughs> very simple. Uh, it doesn't help us represent a lot of information in the input data. But if we were to put these, place these perceptrons uh, one under the other and insert the inputs uh, and try to estimate the output, then that would give us some flexibility. And as a matter of fact, um, according to universal approximation theory, with a one layer of neurons, we can estimate any function. We can model any function. But this is theoretical, and we would need a lot of neurons to do that. And that's why people in machine learning literature have come up with deep neural network architectures, which are actually nothing uh, different than having an input layer, output layer, but in between we have some hidden layers. If the number of hidden layers is greater than one, then we call it a deep uh, neural network. Uh, the design of the deep neural network is of course tricky. There can be many different architectures and recurrent neural networks is just one of them. So if you are working in computer vision, you would be familiar with uh, CNNs, convolutional neural networks. And for uh, natural language processing, RNNs uh, have been very popular. And actually, they, they've been lifesaver. <laughs> uh, because during 1970s, um, 80s, uh, there was this uh, phenomena called AI winter. Because of the, um, I mean, it was mostly because of the uh, unsuccessful trials with translations during Cold World War uh, that you know, machine learning algorithms did not, did not uh, perform very well. So there was funding cuts. Uh, but then the beginning of 2000s, people came up with RNN architectures, which proved to be very, very successful for NLP research. And the reason they are successful, they were successful, is because they can catch 
grab and represent the temporal behavior and data. So a network, imagine a network that can remember thousands or millions steps back. And isn't that very natural for language, right? Because we keep repeating the same things. Luckily, that applies to networks as well. So when we think of networks, we use LSTM a lot. LSTM, long short term memory, is a type of RNN and it has some memory structure in it. That memory works like this. So our network has two inputs, a memory input and an input or the output of the previous LSTM unit. So it goes into some forget gates and output gates. And what happens is, again at the out, oops, again at the output, we had the memory to be transferred to the next unit and also output from the previous LSTM unit. Now, of course, uh, right now, the way I'm describing it is that we, okay, we have an LSTM network, a neural network that has a memory. We just put it in front of, stick it <laughs> in front of the reinforcement learning and it works wonders. Um, not so. <laughs> we had to wait for uh, some more research uh, to define uh, a little bit more um, concepts or put pieces of the puzzle uh, in a more proper way uh, to be able to come up with uh, deep reinforcement learning. And this research came out from Google Mind researchers in 2015, published in Nature. And after that, there has been many techniques to improve this. And the fun, I mean, what, what are we improving? What are we trying to improve, first of all? Uh, if we just stick a neural network um, to drive the values of Q-table and Q-learning, reinforcement learning, uh, we, we are faced with a lot of stability problems. So to overcome the stability and overestimation, there are a couple of uh, adjustments, let's say, uh, proposed in this 2015 article. Number one is the target deep neural network. So there's an actual deep neural network that is working. And then there's a target deep neural network where we continuously keep the trained neural network, uh, where we continuously keep transferring the trained neural network uh, values weights. Number two mechanism is experience replay memory. Experience replay memory helps us uh, select a mini batch of examples and derive the uh, reinforcement learning uh, based on these values. And if you carefully look at this picture, that's actually a gene OB inside a base station of 5G. It doesn't have to be, uh, but that's how we uh, draw it because I'm gonna make a smooth switch to our uh, research in, uh, in this area. And the environment is the wireless area. So basically that gene OB is going to take an action. It could be a lot of things. I mean, there are so many decisions that a base station uh, makes. Resource allocation is just one of them, physical resource block allocation. Power allocation, another one. Beam alignment, beam management, many decisions. So anything could be an action or a combination of any of these could be an action for a base station. Then as the feedback, uh, there's again a lot of varied feedback that is coming, but we are not very, um, sort of unlimited in terms of the feedback because it has to be compliant with the standards as well. We cannot just assume you know, we're getting uh, anything uh, that we want. Uh, and CQI seems to be a very good and relevant feedback uh, in this case. So we use a lot the channel quality uh, index. That is a measure of SANR. Uh, that is measured at the users. Now, uh, here, let's switch gears because I start, I already started talking about some of the things that we did and let's put a name officially and let me explain how we use machine learning for optimizing 5G and then how you know these techniques are going to penetrate into 6G. I'm going to start the discussion, start the descriptions by one of our works that was presented in June 2020 in ICC. Uh, so over there in our paper, what we did is we, we considered a millimeter wave network, which has uh, directional cells. And uh, the beams formed by the G node these can, of course, be intersecting. And for the users who are in the intersection of these beams, now we have the question, which beam to be associated with? And what would be the resource block allocation for these users? Uh, for this paper in particular, we use NOMA, but we could have gone with OFDM as well. The, um, the thing about NOMA is that the users have to do successive interference cancellation to be able to extract their, uh, their received signals successfully. So interference becomes more of an issue and successful operation of our Q-learning-based method is, uh, is more important. So in this one, we stick with Q-learning instead uh, of using deep 
uh, reinforcement learning, and we try to keep the state and action space to a small, uh, small size. So our problem is joint user cell association, cell replaces beam, of course, user beam association, and then beam power allocation. So we have, we consider uh, G node B as the agent. We have actions uh, delta and pi delta determines the association of the UE to the uh, respective beam and power selects the power of, the, uh, of that certain beam. Uh, as I said, we want to, I mean, we decided to use Q-learning in this problem, so we couldn't increase our uh, states and actions too much. So we have two actions and we have, we, we came up with two state uh, definitions. State in our case, in our problem definition is dependent on SINR measurements, basically the CQI value. If the average uh, SINR value is greater than a certain threshold, we said, okay, we are in the desired state because we can give enough performance to uh, users. If it is not the case, then we are in an undesired state. So we want to drive our agent to the desired state by also giving its reward. The definition of reward is also simple and it is associated with the SNR value. We give one for a successful uh, or good channel selection, good association and power allocation selection. We give minus one, a penalty for an action uh, of association and power selection in a bad direction. So with this work, we were able to show that uh, our Q-learning based uh, algorithm was uh, able to show 13% uh, percent improvement at lower loads and 33% improvement at higher loads with respect to uniform power allocation. Now, uh, the tricky part comes, what is the cost of this? Well, there is a very long convergence time. So if we were to implement these schemes on a real base station, it would have been taken a very long time to converge to these uh, nice results. So what we consider, what a lot of the people in the literature consider is that we have an offline training phase. So we consider the traffic will be stationary for us uh, for some time. We will have the opportunity to train our base stations to take certain actions, and then we can get this sweet performance. This is a problem. We cannot always rely on offline training, things change dynamically. So our ultimate goal should be reducing that convergence time. I'm going to show one work where we try to do that, but before that, I think I have something else. Yes, I have another technique that was uh, published in the same year in Globcom 2020, but it's using deep reinforcement learning. So I want to show you an example of deep reinforcement learning as well, and then we're gonna talk about that convergence. Uh, so in this work, what we try to do is we, um, focused on radio resource and beam management problem. Again, uh, you know, directional beams, but here we have a mobility in the picture. So we have some mobile users and they are deciding on uh, beam associations based on their respective locations. So here, in, uh, one interesting thing about this paper is we used two types of machine learning algorithms. And one is not in the class of reinforcement learning, it's in the class of unsupervised learning algorithms, which is a very well-known clustering technique that's called BB scan algorithm. So with BB scan, we clustered the mobile users and it's an online version of BB scan. So it's adaptively changing the clusters of the UEs and the cars equals. Uh, and then once um, a beam association is done, we use deep reinforcement learning for resource block, physical resource block allocation uh, inside uh, each beam. And again, I'm sorry. Uh, and again, in this picture, like you see the feedback has become the CQI. So you can see like there's a name to it. It could have been other things as well, but we, we like to use CQI because it comes with the uh, measurements from the user devices and the actions are a selection of the right uh, physical uh, resource blocks. Now let's look at the results. Um, I'm not going to repeat what I said, like the, that slide was explaining more or less what I explained before. Uh, so let's look at latency and sum rate as our, uh, because we are trying to accommodate URLC users and EMBB users at the same time. We want to do good for latency in terms of, uh, or we want to favor URLC users in terms of latency. And also we want to be careful about the sum rate for EMBB users. So uh, we are seeing in figure three and figure four, uh, the uh, different uh, latency values 
of your LLC users under different floats. So the first plot on the uh, top left-hand side is showing us the, um, low, uh, the case about low loads. So we have um, 0.5 and one megabits per second per user load. And we still see some improvement or the, of the deep Q learning based algorithm with respect to a, a priority proportional fair algorithm that was proposed a couple of months before us. Uh, that, was a, that was in the literature already. Uh, and for higher load regime, we see that our achievements are actually uh, quite significant. When we look at the sum rate of EMDB, um, Again, looking at two different offered load regimes, we see that we have uh, we still do we can still favor EMDB users. So we're doing good for 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 both ends. But now the question about uh, convergence: How do we, uh, you know, again this uh, scheme about deep reinforcement learning? Uh, it has some problems about convergence. We have to wait uh, thousands of steps for uh, for convergence using deep reinforcement learning helps us to solve the um, size of the Q table problem. Uh, but when it comes to convergence, we need something more. So in our uh, very recent paper, I'm just gonna switch to this slide, uh, that was published in May, 2021, uh, we explored the use of transfer reinforcement learning. And we were, uh, I believe at the time, one of the, uh, there were two groups on using these techniques in wireless. Uh, one of the uh, two groups uh, who initiated this area and started using trans transfer reinforcement learning. It's a very promising area, uh, but it is different than transfer learning. So transfer learning has been there uh, in machine learning literature for a very long time, uh, especially to drive supervised learning techniques for deep uh, reinforcement learning techniques, uh, for deep learning techniques, sorry. But doing transfer in reinforcement learning is relatively new to machine learning. It came with the robotics literature, uh, but still it has been you know, much before than wireless. And for wireless, as I said, uh, these are newly flourishing areas. So for transfer reinforcement learning, what we did is we have an expert G node B and a learner G node B. Expert G node B uses numerology zero. It has omnidirectional antenna and it's only learning user cell association. Our learner G node B is able to transfer the Q table of expert G node B, but it is doing a different task. It is doing joint user cell association, plus it is uh, performing uh, the selection of number of peaks. So with this, um, these are the channel models for the expert and learner. Uh, with this, we were able to show that, uh, first of all, we looked at the convergence of expert genome B just using Q learning. It was uh, learning in a certain number of peak size, but then most importantly, we wanted to reduce the convergence of learner genome Bs. And we were able to show that um, transfer reinforcement learning approach uh, converges faster than the case if we had used Q learning for the learner genome piece. Uh, this is just the tip of the iceberg. I think we still have a lot of research to do here, but um, uh, convergence matters needs to be addressed and transfer reinforcement learning seems to be a promising method. Uh, I know that I want to leave some time for the questions, so I'm not going to get into the details of uh, KPIs, but um, if you're interested, you can find them in the paper. I'm going to instead wrap up my talk with uh, two slides. And uh, I like calling this the AI spring. It's not the summer, so we are not there yet. We don't have uh, prime time ready techniques for AI to take over 5G or 6G. We are still working on the tip of the iceberg, but I can say that there is a lot to be done in this area. And we have the opportunity. So if, if we didn't have the data from the field, we wouldn't be going for data-driven decisions. We would still be looking for model-based uh, learning approaches, but now it is the time that we have lots of data coming from the field. And in this talk, I only focused on the control approach. Believe me, there is a lot of research and industry efforts done on analytics, network analytics, and trying to improve performance by using supervised, unsupervised learning techniques. Another thing, another major area that I did not talk about, federated learning. Uh, that's, a, that's a type of distributed learning, which is, again, another uh, you know, flourishing, interesting area. 
but I only focused on reinforcement learning, which gives us the control capabilities. Even with that, we see that with software-centric designs, with more distributed computational capacity at the edge and more disaggregation at the front hall at the run side, we are seeing that complexities are increasing. And because of these complexities, using AI becomes um, almost inevitable. Now, within this almost inevitable uh, situation, of course, you know, we have to be truthful to ourselves and talk about the challenges and open problems. As I said, convergence is still a big problem. Uh, in my lab, we are doing a lot uh, on this area to solve this problem. Scalability, likewise, we are usually showing things for one or two base stations, but if these things are, were to be put in the field, they have to work for um, hundreds, uh, about tens or hundreds of base stations altogether. Another problem that is mentioned a lot by, uh, not just by myself, by a lot of researchers, is the lack of standardized training sets. We are seeing a little bit of existence of some training sets, but still we need more. And remember, one of the main drivers of NLP and computer vision was the availability of data sets, standardized data sets. So if you want to make wireless another branch like this for machine learning, we definitely need standardized training sets. Uh, another very interesting problem that's, uh, again, dear to my heart is distributed agents. So it, it is, well, I, I won't say it's not challenging, but it is less challenging when we consider a centralized agent. But if we're talking about a multi-agent environment, then uh, we have to really reconsider what we are doing with learning agents, how we define goals, how we uh, cope with the convergence, all of them become much more complex techniques. And these are actually uh, the type of environments that we are working. So we need to do more research in this area. And finally, not the last, but not the least, is learning the rare events. Uh, so, in, and this, this comes into, um, you know, troubleshooting part of networks. Um, we hope that we don't have a lot of failures in a network, but when a failure happens, we want to be able to deal with it in a very good way, in a very efficient way. So these rare events that are happening in the network, an oversized queue, a failure, a blockage, something, how are we going to learn from these uh, rarely happening events? Because most of our uh, reinforcement learning or data-driven approaches consider that we have abundance of data, we have abundance of chance of trials so that we can learn well. But if we don't have that chance, we need to look for uh, fewer shot learning techniques. With this, I wanna wrap up my talk. I want to thank all my students, uh, postdocs in the lab for their uh, efforts in making these research possible. And I want to say thank you to the audience for listening to my keynote. And I'd be very happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thanks a million, Mel. Uh, let's uh, tap together here from wherever we are. And um, I will open up for questions. We have seven, eight minutes for comments, questions. And we will see also what uh, Professor Mati Latva Aho will say in the future of wireless uh, systems. So it's going to be very interesting to compare the two talks. But I'll leave the, the, the floor open to ask questions for Mel or have comments. Let's see who is there. Let's see if someone is shy, you could write in the chat as well. I personally feel this usage of AI in, in the future networks is extremely interesting, making the networks, I mean, more dynamic, flexible, and taking all these things. I'm personally starting a few projects in that area. So I really, really like your ID smell, and I feel you're very advanced in your thinking and, and uh, thoughts. So I'm extremely happy to, to hear this. But I would like to have, give the chance to everybody to give some overall comments or detailed questions. Hey, Carl, I, I can ask a question. This Go ahead, Kemal. Good to hear your voice. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, hi, hi, Melike, how are you? Hello, Kemal. Very nice good job. to see you virtually. <laughs> yes. Uh, so thank you. Uh, I was recently looking at uh, some of the opportunities in, in 6G for AI. Uh, I understand that there's a lot of uh, uh, things going on with network management side as well. I, I, I saw you mentioned about performance issues. 
but there's also a lot of effort to make this a living, living organism, as you mentioned, that can take care of itself eventually. Uh, so I see a lot of uh, AI and machine learning approaches in general, lots of papers. Uh, my question is uh, about the contribution to the AI or machine learning theory. So I know that machine learning or AI was there for many years, right? I mean, there has been a lot of research before we started using them in certain applications. Um, so when people publish these papers, I wonder if they just uh, use existing uh, AI approaches or machine learning approaches uh, and apply it to a specific problem in the cellular domain, or there is uh, a new problem and, and a new approach that also contributes to the theory of machine learning. Uh, I'm not from the AI background, so I just wonder um, if this is the case or not, uh, or mm -hmm. if, if, you, if you can comment on this, uh, I'll, I'll appreciate it. Absolutely, and uh, I think this is an excellent question. Uh, right now, the, the place that we are at is mostly using uh, algorithms that uh, from machine learning literature. Uh, there are a couple of innovations, like the one that I showed in our transfer reinforcement learning paper uh, that, um, you know, we also showed how transfer could be done uh, in different ways. Uh, but I can say that most of the literature uh, and the researchers are at the point of exploring and using uh, the existing techniques from the machine learning literature. But I see the future very bright. I see almost where you know, people started with NLP and computer vision, that those were the you know, uh, areas that drive the research in machine learning. Now wireless will be one of the drivers of machine learning techniques. I think we're gonna see this in the future. Robotics as well, of course, um, is an important area. We'll see a lot of these, but uh, with the interdisciplinary approaches, uh, this, can, uh, this can get, uh, you know, uh, in more, uh, more into effect. But at the moment, um, when we look at the machine learning techniques, AI techniques, uh, that's one of the reasons they're also considered not ready for prime time. Uh, we have lots of problems, even with the existing techniques. So we have to do a lot of tailoring, a lot of uh, tricks to make those algorithms uh, work for uh, real systems. Still, you know, if we were to take, um, you know, an approach uh, and plug it into base stations, we might have problems. So it's very well known that these are not ready, these algorithms are not ready for prime time. And as I said, we are uh, looking at the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot of research like people like us has to do uh, in order to make these algorithms converge fast, scalable, that would also contribute to the machine learning literature. So this is one side. Um, another uh, side is from federated learning part. That's an area I think that answers your question in a, in a better way. Uh, the research in federated learning also uh, looks at how wireless can improve uh, learning performance. So that is very unique. I see that as a very unique area. In today's presentation, I did not talk about this, you know, because of the time limitations. Uh, but um, if we are using a distributed environment where devices are connected using 5G, then how can we optimize learning, the machine learning performance by jointly considering the resources available in wireless and also the convergence uh, and loss functions that are, uh, you know, that has to be defined in federated learning. So that particular area is probably, you know, what you are asking most. For the others, I think we will get to that point as well. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. Uh, it, it looks like uh, there will be not theory, but engineering contribution here uh, when taking the, these solutions to the practice. Uh, there's scalability issues, as, as you mentioned, uh, and that's also very interesting and valuable. I see it. Thank you. Thank you. Great question, and thanks for the very insightful answer, Mel. Uh, let's see. We have one minute to go, so one more chance. Anybody having questions or comments for Mel before we wrap up this keynote session?
If no, I see two hands up. There's two hands uh, up. I think they okay. are yeah. questions. Absolutely. We have first Nils and then let me see. I have to scroll down. Let's begin with Nils. Yes. Oh, hi. Thanks for the great talk. Um, I'm just wondering a bit um, if you're using this deep learning models, um, some things are not really explainable. So my question is going towards explainable AI because you mentioned that computer vision is one of the areas where these models have been used. And they have, it has been shown that some of those models uh, are using, for example, the wrong parts of the pictures and then yeah, finding criteria that are not really good so if you look deeper into this you you quickly see that this you know, deep learning model has failed how can you be sure that this is not happening in our wireless networks and that yeah that these models are yeah they're not explainable and that they are optimizing it in the wrong direction mm -hmm. that, that is an excellent question which i don't have the answer for <laughs> but this is a very very important I uh, think to be careful about. And this is one of the things where industry is mostly concerned about it. When you talk to industry about these techniques, they are worried about these, these um, uh, you know, in general, machine learning techniques that could become black box techniques. And, uh, you know, we, we don't have uh, the explainability. So I think this is one area that uh, I did not mention in my slides, but it's good that you gave me the opportunity to articulate more on it. We need more explainable models. And um, we need to be able to drive performance in a good way and just not say, you know, we did it, it works, rather than this, it works because of this. This is really, really important. Thank you. Good. Thanks a lot. Good question, good answer. One uh, remaining from Ahmad. Quick uh, yes. Yeah, thank you very much for the interesting presentation. Um, and thank you for highlighting some of the challenges, uh, which is really interesting. Uh, but as you mentioned, like lots of people uh, uh, partially address these challenges in the research, they, they are mainly using the, the machine learning and specifically uh, deep reinforcement learning in their uh, research. So in your opinion, how can we like push the DRL based solutions towards being adopted in, in real networks? Mm -hmm. uh, well, to, to make these techniques, to make AI techniques in general prime time ready, um, I think convergence stands in our way a lot uh, because apparently if we are talking about such a dynamic system like wireless and then uh, we wait for models to converge for some iterations, that's going to be an obvious problem. Uh, as Nils mentioned, explainability is another thing and scalability uh, is, uh, I think, comes as, uh, you know, number three important factor. Um, to be able to do that, I think we need more research. So for 5G, we weren't able to uh, implement these uh, proposed techniques, neither us you know, nor uh, other researchers around the world were able to uh, penetrate these things into the releases. But for 6G, um, we need more research in this area to improve these schemes and be ready for uh, use in networks. And it requires a lot of collaboration with industry as well. Um, I myself, we have lots of industry sponsors that we work on uh, on their projects. We try to improve the, those, uh, you know, approaches. And I believe by, uh, well, number one, interdisciplinary. We need to include, of course, machine learning AI researchers. As engineers, we're going to play a part. And then the industry also has to play its role by collaborating with the university and, uh, you know, bringing us uh, closer to, to the deployments, to the real deployments. Very good. Thanks, Emilia and Meliki, for all your insightful comments and um, answers to the questions. Thank you, Ahmad, for asking. So by that, I conclude this keynote session. Uh, thanks a lot for coming. And I now leave the floor to Lais and Sharif to share the next session. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah. Thanks, Mel. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.